fantastic to be able to um, introduce Phil Green, uh, who's of course professor here, and in fact is the reason that we are all here, because if Phil hadn't come here in 1985 and set up uh, initially Splash and subsequently Spandage, uh, which of course has become a, a, one of the major groups in the UK, or indeed internationally, um, that's all down to uh, Phil. Um, but I also note um, that Phil was a student of Bill Ainsworth uh, at Keele, who many of the older members here will of course know, uh, remember Bill very well, sadly no longer with us, but we also owe that person a, a great debt because Bill was a, a, a very a prominent uh, figure in the original speech group, uh, which kicked off in the 1970s, and uh, we held um, annual meetings for many years at the Hydro Hotel in Windermere. Brilliant. So rather than moving around, we were in one location. So I just plant that idea back into the <laughs> revived <laughs> committee. Uh, that, that is also a possibility. Roger, it's an old people's home now. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we've got some interesting historical connections, but we're here to um, listen to Phil. Phil has done a huge amount of work over the years, obviously setting up a large group like this. Uh, people know him for missing data, speech sketch, but one of the really important areas which he kicked off is the use of uh, or the uh, application of speech in clinical areas. And so we've asked him if he'll talk about that this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Roger. You do realise I'm missing an examination board in order to give this talk. <laughs> So my title is Clinical Challenges for Speech Technology, and uh, my coverage is, is like this. Um, I'm going to talk about um, technology which can help the clinicians and technology which can help their patients, their clients. So under helping cl clinicians we, will be, for instance, ways of improving diagnosis of speech disorders and um, ways of providing therapy and learning aids, which also, of course, uh, help patients. Then I'm going to talk about the problems involved in automatic speech recognition for disordered speech and um, two synthesis topics, uh, silent speech and uh, building voices. That's my uh, kind of layout. And um, since this is the last talk, I'll get my take home messages in first and see if you all walk out. Um, so, the argument I'm going to make is that um, I will show that speech technology can be adapted for clinical applications, that doing that involves some interesting technical problems, um, but we're not doing as much to get our technology out there and actually actually helping people as we should be. Um, so this is a review talk with a bit of attitude to it and because this is the message I'm trying to get over. And I'll wind up with uh, outlining a new opportunity in which we might be able to improve the collaboration between clinicians and technologies to mutual benefit. That's my plan. Uh, so a few general uh, points about um, clinical challenges to begin with. Uh, first of all, the scale of the challenge. Um, you can measure this in various ways, but um, it's probably fair to say that 5% of the population has speech communication problems at some point in their lives. There's the entire population of Glasgow for a start. <laughs> and uh, it's certainly true to say that um, the professionals who help people with speech problems are in short supply, um, not just in the West, not just in the UK. In the UK, um, and there's an increasing need for healthcare, which could be facilitated by um, by speech. For instance, um, speech control assistive technology, for instance, um, monitoring uh, healthcare problems 
through analysing the way people are speaking. And there are potentially tremendous benefits in the third world, the developing world, for technology which can actually uh, reach out to, uh, to people. Uh, here are some American figures. Uh, I'm going to talk about dysarthria in a moment. Um, dysarthria is um, kind of loss of control of the speech articulators. And it's estimated that 7.5 million Americans have dysarthria, which can have various different causes, like cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, and so on. Now, um, if we're talking about clinical applications, what does it mean to actually succeed? Because that's a somewhat different question from, uh, or it's got a somewhat different answer than uh, mainstream speech technology. Because, in my opinion, um, clinical applications have to be deployed. They have to be um, out there helping people. So, um, to sort of answer the question, have I succeeded or not, you should be thinking the way that you have to think if you're writing a ref impact case study. Many people will have had that experience in the last couple of years. You know, it's not your academic input uh, um, impact so much as um, your impact in the world outside. And um, it's clear that off-the-shelf technology won't work for non-standard problems. That's still sort of a general property of speech technology. Speech technology nowadays can work well when there's a good match between what it's being asked to do and what it was actually trained to do. Um, and the specialist skills which speech technologies have um, are actually needed to get anywhere with uh, clinical problems. So, um, a few generic uh, problems in this game then. Uh, Off-the-shelf solutions won't work for atypical speech. Um, there's usually, almost always, not as much training data as you would like by several orders of magnitude. And at the same time, there's a need for personalization. That's to say, uh, individuals with speech disorders um, all kind of uh, vary more than the normal population in the way they are affected. Okay? So um, even if you've managed to train for some particular disorder um, and you get a new case of someone with that disorder, um, it's still likely that you have to do something to, uh, to optimise for that new individual. There are poor links between uh, clinicians and technologists. Um, and it's not um, easy to establish um, a profitable working relationship. It takes time, it takes patience. Um, there's a kind of uneasiness amongst many professionals about uh, technology, often because they've been promised in the past things which would actually um, do their job for them, which haven't worked. Um, so if you go and look at uh, the somewhat um, patchy literature around, say, um, adapting automatic speech recognition for disordered speech, then you find uh, kind of papers from clinicians that sort of say things like, um, well, we found that drag and dictate doesn't work very well for people with dysarthria, even though it says on the box that it adapts. Um, and that's my point, that unless you understand the technology well enough to get inside it um, and modify it in some appropriate way, um, you're not going to get very far. And on the other hand, you find papers of the form, well, um, I've developed um, a novel adaptation algorithm and I found this little database of dysarthric speech and I've tried my adaptation algorithm on it and uh, got some promising results. 
for P, and that's a chapter in my thesis or a paper at Interspeech and so on. And that's it, end of story. Okay? And what I'm saying is that there's a lot more work involved to bridge those two extremes, okay? To get uh, our technology out there helping people. You need a multidisciplinary team and you're often uh, faced with a situation where there is not a lot of money around, okay? Um, speech and language therapists um, often work with little resources, no money to spare, um, fighting for every penny, every euro, hopefully, I would say. Um, so, um, I'll say a bit about dysarthria now. Um, dysarthria is like a, a, a syndrome which can have many different causes. Uh, so, it's due to loss of control of the speech articulators, and that could be in stroke victims, in cerebral palsy. Um, uh, MS, motor neuron disease and so on. Some cases are going to be stable and some cases are going to be progressive. It's getting worse. Okay? Um, um, it's in the UK affects 170 uh, people out of every 100,000 and in severe cases um, uh, dysarthric speech is unintelligible to strangers. And it's often accompanied by physical disability because there's some underlying cause. Okay. Um, give you an example or two then. What's he saying? Single word. Is it loud enough? Yeah. Sorry? I'm going to guess. It'll be louder. Um, okay. Let's try the next one. That was channel. Um. Lamp. Yeah. You're already starting to learn something about this guy's speech, actually. Uh, but this particular person is relatively okay on one or two syllable words, but what's this? No. Radio. Okay. Um, so, um, if you have moderate to severe dysarthria, your speech is not going to be understood by strangers. However, uh, commu speech communication between such people and um, their relatives or their carers or their loved ones is often very effective. Okay? When you watch it happening, it's quite a different game with lots of kind of feedback and sort of coming to a mutual agreement about what's been said. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off with the problem of assessing dysarthric speech. Um, there are, um, there, there are um, several tests which uh, therapists use, and uh, the one that's most commonly used in the UK is the French A test, devised by Professor Pam Enderby, um, who um, has now retired from this university. And it's a combination of uh, observations of the patient, uh, giving the patients tasks and observing how well they uh, accomplish those tasks and measuring intelligibility. One thing that might be surprising to people coming from a speech technology background is that recordings are rarely made. Okay? Um, it's just not a normal thing to do. Um, so although the French A test has been, must have been um, administered tens of thousands of times. Uh, the student whose work we're going to look at in a moment um, had about 70 um, examples of you know, recorded sounds of people doing the tasks in a French A test. Okay, and um, the outcome 
is generally um, no more quantitative than mild or moderate or severe. Okay? Um, intelligibility uh, is measured subjectively by listening tests. Okay? Now, there are a lot of ways that you think you might be able to uh, improve that situation using technology. Okay? Um, and although the examples I'm going to take today are nearly all positive, I'm going to start with a cautionary tale. Um, I had a student who set out to produce a computerized version of the French A dysarthria assessment test. Um, so uh, he wrote software which would guide the therapist through uh, the 25 or so tests which tasks, tests are parts of um, the French A test using kind of um, the same words as in the paper version. Um, some of the tasks involve um, speech analysis and um, um, this guy James um, Carmichael um, wrote software to try to perform those um, uh, tasks automatically. The result of the French A test is, uh, is a bar chart. So here's an example um, of a window from James's program uh, associated one of the, with one of the tests where uh, um, I'll put the wording of the test up in a moment because it's interesting. Um, but basically, you're asking um, the subject to increase in volume and uh, you see how well they're able to, to, to do that uh, consistently. At the end of the French A test, you get something like this. Uh, so this is the 25 tests on the x-axis here. And particular shapes in here kind of correspond to particular diagnoses. Okay? So again, you think that you ought to be able to um, do some <coughs> machine learning on data like that. Okay, now, um, um, we fail to get acceptance of the computerized test amongst speech professionals. Okay? And there are a number of reasons why, um, but um, one important factor was that um, these, the software which produces, the, which produce, uh, produced these results could not be made specific, uh, as reliable as um, therapists would like, and that sort of reinforced the attitude that they had that uh, here's someone trying to give me something which he says will do my job but it's no good and just doesn't get it right. Okay? Um, and if you look at the, the wording, uh, Pam's wording for this test, you see, you know, there, there be dragons. Uh, ask the patient to count to five, increasing volume on each number, start in a whisper, end up with a very loud voice. And so on. And the rating is an A if the patient is able to change the volume, B if change the volume, volume evidence, but no voltage change, volume change between one and more pairs, and so on and so on. Now, these questions are things which uh, uh, are ones which uh, therapists, with their training, find it easy to answer. But actually, you know, there's a lot of a subtlety hidden in there. There's the relationship between uh, intensity and perceived loudness, for instance. Okay, um, and we couldn't um, get um, things working in uh, in a sufficiently reliable way um, um, for this to be adopted, which is a great shame. So. Um, Lessons from this, um, clinicians need to remain in control all the time. Um, there was an impression that this program is trying to take over my job and I don't like that. And expert judgments are hard to explicitly model, okay? Um, when you try to uh, introspect and work out exactly um, how people are making these decisions, you might be wrong. Um, so I move on from that um, to the problem of um, 
intelligibility. Um, so this is the last part of the French aid test, which uh, my student never really um, did much about, but other people have. And a piece of work I like um, is uh, Catherine Midag and her um, supervisor, Jean-Pierre Martin from Ghent in Belgium, um, who have developed um, an intelligibility metric which, which requires running speech, not text dependent. You know, you can sort of provide um, any passage that you like and it will provide some um, measure of intelligibility for you. It's got a phonological basis, uh, you extract phonological features and then use neural nets as the basis for the classification. It's been developed um, into a tool, which is called the DIA, Dutch Intelligibility Assessment. It's done for Dutch and um, because it's phonologically based, an English version will be more work, okay? Um, because Dutch phonology is not the same as English. Um, and there is some take up now in Dutch hospitals. Um, and um, here's an example from one of Catherine's papers um, where in the end what you're doing is train um, something to um, take the features that you've measured and compute uh, uh, and, uh, and, and produce a score which replicates the score um, which has been obtained subjectively through listening tests. Okay? And it kind of works pretty well. So what that is suggesting well, intelligibility is a subjective thing. There's no real gold standard. But if you want to um, replicate that, it might be safer to use uh, machine learning to sort of get from what you uh, think you can measure to what the judgment should be, rather than um, say, take an expert system sort of approach as James Carmichael did. But there is a lot of work required to go from lab to field, okay? 2010, 2015, and it's only just being taken up. Yeah. So that's a big gap to bridge. Moving on um, um, to therapy and learning aids, um, there are tremendous potential benefits here. Um, speech therapy is a sort of very one-to-one, -one, hands-on, game at the moment um, and in the UK I think you're entitled to something like four 30 minute sessions with a therapist which is often not enough to um, make any um, any serious progress but you know much more progress could be made with more time but the time isn't there um, so potentially if you can set if you can um, have an application which allows a therapist to set up an individual training program, computer-based, which the patient is then able to practice in her or his own time. It provides um, feedback, it monitors progress, and it records all the responses, and the uh, kind of productivity of a speech and language therapist can be increased tremendously. Um, in this way. So I'm going to look at, we've had several projects with that um, kind of theme and I'm going to look at one which is current at the moment which is called STAR. It's the second project in this meeting called STAR that's been mentioned. Um, uh, Stuart Cunningham, who I don't think he's here, no, is the PI of this. Uh, it's funded <coughs> as a lot of our work is by in clinical applications by the National Institute for Health Research, that's the research arm of the NHS, and their program, Innovation for Industry, or something I think that means. Uh, there is a, a commercial partner called Therapy Box, and um, Star uses speech recognition technology to support a therapist who is del delivering articulation therapy, that's to say, move your articulators correctly to produce the sound I want you to. And it builds on previous work in which we have shown that um, you can get um, kind of scores from ASR matches um, to, that measure 
um, the sort of goodness of your pronunciation um, sufficiently well to be the basis for feedback. Um, Star um, is a tablet or iPhone application. There has been a lot of work between technologists, therapists and the industrial partner to um, evolve the design for STAR. It's got a friendly interface which therapists are happy with. There are focus groups um, consulting with therapy clients. There are expert panels to validate the pronunciation scoring metrics. And um, it basically is going to work. You know, it's not there yet, it's got about six months to run. But uh, it's clear that it's going, to, it's going to work, it's going to be a product. But underneath it, in STAR, the speech recognition is very simple because there's very little data available on which to train. There are whole word models personalized for each speaker. So uh, the sort of therapist and their client might have a session where uh, clients are being asked to produce a particular word does it several times, the therapist says, oh, that was a good example, and so was that, that wasn't so good, and so on and so on, until you have something like 10 of each, as few as that, and then you train a good model and a bad model, and then the feedback, when it's in use, is based on the difference between the fit to the good and the bad models. And, um, and that, uh, that works. Um, and, um, so he wasn't supposed to come up yet. Uh, he'll go away again in the next click, I think. Uh, this is just to illustrate that uh, the feedback can be made from, okay? So, um, when you speak your word, you get your, um, your score, 24% in this case, then the monkey climbs uh, up the tree. Okay? And, um, you know, so you can, you, you can encourage particular children um, to practice, to uh, see things happen. And this is what therapists call the virtuous circle. Okay? Um, you have to set tasks which um, your client is able to succeed in. Okay? If they're too hard, then you'll just demotivate them. Okay? Um, but as a therapy progresses, and the pronunciation improves, you can make the tasks harder and you close this virtuous circle. And provided you keep it closed, you can make rapid progress. STAR allows you to do that. And um, it's coming to its evaluation stage and basically um, it's concentrated on stroke survivors and children with hearing difficulties who are two quite different populations. Okay? So, speech technology under, underlying STAR is very simple indeed, but a lot of attention has been paid to getting it right from the therapist's point of view, to getting the system to appear right. Halfway through, that's about right. I'll move on next to um, trying to um, recognize dysarthric speech. Um, as I said before, dysarthria often co occurs with typical with physical disabilities and often it's an effort um, for people affected to speak. So they can't produce much speech um, and uh, what they do produce is not going to be normal by any means but there are potentially important applications. Um, if you've got a physical disability and you require assistive technology to operate devices in your home or your wheelchair and so on, but you're unable to use a keyboard at all, okay, then uh, speech is an attractive alternative even if you can't speak very much. Yeah? Um, and then there's the question of um, can you uh, use ASR to improve communication with strangers? Um, so if you think of this as an ASR problem, then you say, then on one hand you could say, oh, it's a simple problem. If you think of sort of command and control, so there's a small vocabulary, 
of isolated words. It's speaker dependent, okay? And there's strong semantic constraints. So if you're controlling your television, you know, sort of TV channel seven kind of thing, and you can restrict the complexity uh, at each point. On the other hand, you're only ever going to have small amounts of training data. Within that data, of the data you have, there will be higher variability uh, in the speech because of the inability to control articulators. There will be outlier speakers. It's not as if you're going to say, uh, it's not going to be like the normal situation where you have a population of speakers, most of whom um, sort of um, fit your statistics and there are a few outliers. It's going to be sort of all outliers, if you like. And again, if this is going to be used for real, it has to be used in domestic environments, okay? where there are all sorts of things that you cannot control, as we're about to see. Um, but it's interesting to note that, in a sense, speech recognition is most difficult for the people who need it most. Okay? The people who have difficulty um, in controlling things in any other way. Okay, um, so we've been working on ASR for dysarthric speech for uh, some time, um, and one part of the work has been uh, just uh, trying to um, apply uh, speaker uh, adaptation. Uh, to this material using um, the UA speech database, which is one of the few databases of dysarthric speech available, collected by Mark Hasegawa Johnson and his team. Um, but it's tiny compared to what you expect nowadays. Uh, 15 speakers um, and about an hour speech each, I think. Um, and obviously I'm not going to go through this huge table, uh, but just to point out, um, in sort of the last five years or so, um, these are the different um, um, kind of schemes for adaptation that have been tried by Heidi Christensen and latterly largely by, um, um, by Mauro Nicolau. So, and as you see over time, GMMs become DNMs and so on. Okay. Um, these are the, uh, the 16 speakers in, um, in the UA speech database, ordered by their subjective intelligibility. And you can see that you, know, you can do pretty well. Um, and over time, our sort of average over all these speakers has risen to that sort of 65.1 accuracy. These are sort of single words. Um, and for the speakers, whose condition is kind of mild, um, we're getting uh, pretty high scores. So all that's sort of offline using the existing database. Um, so adaptation can be made to work for most disordered speakers, but different schemes work best for different speakers. Okay, there's no sort of single scheme which you should always use. Um, and it's clear that there's a need for a larger corpus to sort of get much further with this, um, with this task. There might be sort of regularities underneath this, uh, linking it to sort of different conditions and so on, but you just can't tell with what data is available. Now, in conjunction with that, um, within the NST uh, project, we've been running a uh, home service. Um, so, the idea of home service is to help um, users um, who um, need voice command and control, typically of their TV sets and that kind of thing, um, in their homes. Okay? Um, but to have the um, speech tech running uh, remotely, okay? um, which conveys a number of advantages. You know, you can collect all the speech, subject to ethical permissions. You can modify your recognition algorithms without sort of going out to visit 
and so on. Um, you know, you uh, have more sort of experimental con control over what's happening. Um, it's important to note that home service is a longitudinal study. That's to say the idea is um, that someone works with this system over a long period, you collect more and more of their speech, uh, you should be able to improve performance uh, because of that. Um, okay, so uh, this is the setup. Um, if you're starting this project today, you know, the sort of technological platform wouldn't be the same. As it, is, uh, as, as, as it was now. You wouldn't have this sort of dedicated broadband line. Um, now, home service really is speech recognition in the wild. Okay? And um, let me just make a few points about what that means. It could take months to get the ethical permissions to do work like this. Okay? It can take months to actually enrol a user and go through all the stages that the ethical permissions uh, require. It might take weeks to arrange meetings with a user. You're typically working with people who are in poor health um, and you know, might have to go into hospital for a period or whatever. It's domestic ASR, so there are other sounds present the TV is likely to be on, for instance. Um, you can't use a close talking microphone because most people who are disabled just can't tolerate that. Okay? Um, sometimes the user and the carer both have to be present for it to work. And you get things like this. Uh, Recognizer was working fine. The user got a new TV set, it wouldn't work anymore. Why? And of course they didn't realise um, that the new TV has a different infrared controller. Okay? And of course, things like that can easily put people off. Okay? Uh, now, there is a difficulty in keeping users engaged with the system. This is an NST project. And it certainly is natural speech technology. Right. So um, the recognizer in um, home service uh, is the one developed by uh, Thomas Hines' um, team um, uh, with um, a decoding mode called careful listening. A background model trained on this Arthur speech but then adapted to the speech of an individual user, um, initially with enrollment data, and then with real interaction data as the system is used. Um, 15 to 50 single commands within a sort of strict grammar, TV channel, send, volume, up kind of thing, but a uh, different language for each user, dependent on what devices they wanted to control. Um, um, results from home service, so uh, these are online uh, recognition results, and this guy, who is our star, although he's a, got a severe condition, uh, we wind up with a, um, a good, very practical system for him, after um, a lot of interactions, longitudinal study. For these people, and we're still working with all these people, for these people we have less data and so, so far our results are not so good. Um, this shows um, the progression of our results on that speaker, MO2, for whom we've got a lot of data, and you can show that um, um, it's gone from kind of hopeless to um, just about as well as you can probably get with this guy, given the inherent variability uh, or lack of control of his speech that he has. Okay. Looking at the time, I must speed up. Uh, just to briefly mention, I said that we, I said when I started talking about ASR for these speakers, command and control is one application 
Another is communication with strangers, and we've had a project demonstrating this, again from NIHR called Vivoca, Voice Input, Voice Output, Communication Aid. And Vivoca was like this. Rave A cup of tea with milk and no sugar, please. Um, and, um, you know, we have successful demonstrations of this. Again, it's some time ago now, and it's a project that you should revisit with more modern technology. Um, and, you know, have it running on your phone. I'm going to turn now to speech synthesis. Um, and your voice is part of you, it's part of your personality. You know, one of the most distressing things if you've got a condition, which means you are losing your voice, is, you know, um, coping with that. Um, and there are progressive conditions. For a long time, there, there has been possible to do voice banking, um, initially to provide the data for a concatenative synthesis, so hours and hours of data. But nowadays, I'm coming on to some of the Edinburgh work on this, um, using HMM synthesis, um, much less data, uh, because you can adapt. You don't have to um, build a voice from a complete set of diphones or whatever. Okay, so there's, uh, can you build voices up from this material and then have them speak in a T2S fashion and then uh, also talk about silent speech. I'll explain what I mean by that when I get to it. Um, so adapting HMM synthesis for dysarthric speech. Um, a student of mine, Sarah Priya, uh, kind of started this game with a lot of assistance from Junichi Yamagishi in Edinburgh, and what Sarah showed was that uh, this kind of thing is possible. If you have what's called an average speaker model in HTS, um, and um, some recordings from the speaker who... For the 20th time that in two men shook Hands. So this is a guy with a progressive condition and you can tell what an effort it is for him to speak. Right? Um, but you can take those recordings and you can adapt um, your average speaker model so that it spectrally more resembles um, that speaker. And then what Sarah showed is that you can uh, play around with uh, just which parameters you adapt and which you leave the same. Um, so, for the twentieth time that evening, the two men shook hands. Okay, that's actually a bit faster than it should be, really. Um, for the twentieth time that evening, the two men shook hands. So I was taking that training data, um, using it to adapt the spectral parameter data. Yes, but then using uh, the sort of standard uh, duration uh, for nation and energy information. Okay. Now, um, since then, uh, the team at Edinburgh, Junichi, Christoph Vo, Simon King and others, have sort of taken this and uh, developed it on a large scale, applying to degenerative diseases, uh, particularly Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, um, and uh, looking for personalised voice output communication aids. You know, um, so the thing that you type to and it speaks with your voice or something acceptably like it. And all based on uh, HMM speech synthesis. I'm not sure whether that's entirely true now. Uh, so um, this is a big project. Again, it demonstrates how much effort you have to put in to get into anywhere in the, in, in the field. It's part of NST. I don't have time to go into details, but um, 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 people can donate their voice to this sort of library of voices, which can then be used um, to sort of repair the voice of people with vocal problems in the sort of, by the same sort of principles that I just demonstrated in uh, Sarah's case. 
and uh, from people who can speak well, um, you can bank their voices and then, if you prefer, you can use, you can have a voice clone. Select from our catalogue of voices the way you'd like to speak. And um, several um, ways of doing these voice reconstruction have been tried. Um, best not to go into them, I guess, but the point is that this is out in the field now. As I understand it, and I'm probably behind the times, uh, something like 60 people are sort of out there using these, using these devices now. But a lot of resources gone into it to get to that stage. Right. That's about right now. Um, <coughs> so silent speech. There are people who lose their voice completely, like I'm doing now. Um, but for instance, uh, people who have their hat lights removed, usually because they smoke too much. Um, now for such people, there are some available solutions, but they're not very good. Oh, yeah. Um, this is what the operation does. Um, the entire larynx has been removed. You breathe uh, through this hole called a stoma. Um, and, um, you know, you can't drive your articulator, so you can't produce any speech energy um, at all. Um, available solutions, the electrolarynx, like this. Uh, there is a kind of a valve where you can temporarily close that hole and push air uh, up through the tract. And there's kind of speaking control belches, piece of fagal speech. You might remember the actor Jack Hawkins used to do that. Um, so instead of those solutions, which leave a lot to be desired, um, all of them kind of lose your personality and they're embarrassing and women in particular don't like them. Um, can you provide sensors which somehow detect articulator movement while you mouth your speech and the speech comes out? And then you transform this sensor data into speech somehow. That's the theme of silent speech. A number of groups have worked on it. Here are some silent speech interfaces. This one's based on the EGs, this on the MGs, and this video plus ultrasound but you wouldn't want to walk down the street wearing any of this apparatus, would you? Okay? So, I, in a way, silent speech makes this, is a case of it that makes this problem of getting from the lab into the field really acute. Because no matter um, how well these sensors perform, people aren't going to want to use them. The sensors have to be unobtrusive. Now, we're working with a team at the University of Hull, and they have developed a technique which is unobtrusive uh, called PMA, Permanent Magnetic Articulography. And we have, again, NIHR funding for this. Um, so the way this works is you have small magnets placed on uh, lips and tongue, uh, so small that they resemble that awful jewellery that kids wear. Right? And what you do is detect the changes in magnetic field as you mouth your speech. Now, you can then take that data, that sensor data, and use it as the basis for speech recognition. And we've demonstrated that you can get pretty good results on the smallest vocabulary that way. And uh, other groups who are doing silent speech with other sensory waves have also got similar results. Okay? But at best, if it works that way, it would be like giving someone an interpreter, okay? You mouth what you want to say, you wait, recognizer recognizes, then invokes a synthesizer and produces your speech back for you, okay? Far more attractive is the possibility of direct synthesis. And it was Roger's insight that we should um, kind of pursue this line. Um, so direct synthesis means um, take the sensor data and learn a transformation directly from sensor data to audio. No recognition involved. Okay? 
Hence, for instance, potentially no vocabulary constraints. Hence, for instance, no time delay. You can arrange it, okay? You mouth and the sound comes out, okay? Um, so the appearance of the aid is crucial. And here's Jim Gilbert from Hull wearing this. This is the sensor device. It's actually, that's two years ago, it's actually a lot more uh, unobtrusive than that. Now it's practically invisible. Um, and potentially, because, you know, if we can make this work, um, it would be like getting your voice back. And because um, the speech is, would uh, be being produced while you're actually moving, there's the potential of learning to use it better because it would be like you would close this sort of uh, feedback loop, virtual circle again. It would be like um, learning to play a musical instrument. Okay, that's the hope. So, um, can we do it? Um, well, in training, um, we can have acoustic data and sensor data, so this is from someone who can still speak, right? Um, and we get speech features and sensor features and um, we uh, train something to transform sensor features to speech like this. So when it's being used, uh, this will be the pathway, you're just given the sensor features, your um, trained network or whatever it is produces a speech which you then synthesize. Okay. How well does this do? My name's Ferguson. My name's Ferguson. My name's Ferguson. What was it? My name's Ferguson. Um, Arctic sentences. You might have recognised that if you worked with, Art with Arctic. Um, I'll go on and um, use these examples, I think. And that was a bit too loud, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I won't cheat. Uh, I'll, I'll play um, the reconstructed sound first and then go back to the original. He was pressing beyond the limits of his vocabulary. He was pressing beyond the limits of his vocabulary. He was pressing beyond the limits of his vocabulary. My guess is you've got most of that. Huh? No. I won't reveal it. I won't re reveal it yet. I will in a moment. Um, how about this one? Don't you see I hate you? Don't you see I hate you? Right? Got that, I think. Don't you see I hate you? But the other thing to note is that it's clearly a different voice. Yeah? Now, you don't know those guys, but you might recognise this voice. After all, picture was only a resemblance. Who is it? It's Roger, right? Yeah. After all, picture was only a resemblance. Okay, and I'll reveal these now. And play the originals. Um, so. After all, the picture was only a resemblance. And um, reconstruction. After all, picture was only a resemblance. Okay. And the one you haven't heard yet. Um, My hair is she can be starting to do My hair is she can be starting to do And, you know, you can see that uh, you get sort of whole sequences of words which are fine, okay, and it occasionally breaks down. But we think it's remarkable that it does as well as it could. Given that you also have to remember, you there's no sort of visual input here. Okay. Um, whereas if you're wanting people to actually use this in normal real life conversation, 
where they're looking at the speaker's face, okay, um, you would expect, yeah, just about on cue, you would expect um, to get further, okay? So, uh, lastly on this topic, and then I'm doing my final pitch, um, direct synthesis, going from lab to the clinic, how are we going to do it? At the moment, we've just been experimenting with people with normal speech, um, but we're about to start a clinical study in which the magnets will be implanted as part of the same operation that removes the laryngectomy. The, sur the surgeon who does these operations in the whole area is part of our team. The sensors will go into a pallet in the roof of the mouth, okay? um, and there'll be a speaker in your top pocket. Okay? Um, you require parallel data to do the training, uh, but you often will not be able to get that before the operation. Once the decision to do the operation has been performed, then understandably it happens as quickly as possible. Okay? Um, but what we can do, in many cases we think, is just record speech data um, before the operation and then use a kind of reverse karaoke technique. So listen to what you said and mouth it when the impacts are in place and that gives you the sense of data. And there's the possibility that you can learn to improve your performance with this device. We think this is quite exciting. Um, okay, now, um, going back to my original uh, points, clinical challenges um, include data sparsity and the difficulty to collect corpora and personalization in the technology must adapt to the user rather than demanding that the user adapts to it. So the system must be tailored for its user and it must learn as it's being used. Okay? All these are considerable technical challenges and the only way you can get in anything like the amount of data that you can need was going to be to somehow collect data from systems which are already in use to close this virtuous circle. Okay? Now that and that have to involve speech professionals. It's not something we as speech technologists can do on our own. So how do we get uh, speech professionals involved um, on a large scale? Okay? Well, this is the idea behind the Cloudcast Network. You might have seen the poster for it this morning. Clinical applications of speech technology in the cloud. The idea is to provide a resource for speech professionals which is available worldwide, free of charge, as far as that's possible. Providing software which runs remotely and tools which make it easy to build bespoke clinical applications. Um, to record and organize all such interactions. Okay? To provide databases and thus provide databases for training new technology. Okay? Um, Cloudcast is something which um, I coordinate strong from here. The other partners are uh, the University of Toronto, um, AIAS in Bologna and the University of the West Indies. Not a bad set of places to go for meetings. And it's funded by the Lever Hume Trust. Okay? So my final slide is this. Come and join us. Um, you can contact us from the Cloudcast website or you can talk to me. So I'm through, thank you.